There you go. Now, in 1994, Tom, a young trader and Cambridge physics graduate, authored a paper laying out what he saw as the intellectual front line of investment research. His name was David Harding, and he went on to establish Winton Group, now one of the world's largest hedge funds with assets under management in excess of 30 billion pounds. Well, David Harding, founder and CEO of Winton Group, joins us on set. So with us, Rupert Harrison from BlackRock. He's a multi-asset strategist and, of course, former chief of staff of George Osborne. So, Rupert, thank you so much for sticking around. Uh, David Harding, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. We're very excited to have you here. If you talk to me about the role that machine learning and artificial intelligence has at Winton and on your sector, how big a role is it? Well, I guess the way I feel is that the world has come to us a little bit. We started in the 1980s using computers to read prices in and see if we could make inferences about how to invest. The methods we used back then, I wouldn't call them, we didn't really think of them as intelligent. Um, but I guess they've worked well enough to create a track record over the last 30 years of consistently making money and... Um, and whether that shows that investment management isn't as intelligent as people think it is or our programs were cleverer than people gave them credit for, I'm not sure. But, but is this going to be a bigger slice of the pie? If you look at the, you know, the world of hedge funds in general, and we talk about this almost day in, day out, how much of an influence will it be? You know, back in the 80s and 90s, there was a big dispute about it. Was, it was kind of, you know, computers versus humans. <laughs> and, you know, nobody believed that computers would be any good ever at investment management. Was, people were very invested in it being an art form. Um, and so we kind of, you know, systematic traders always got used to being slightly bullied by the big boys in the classroom. I think that, you know, it's been a sort of hare in the tortoise race in the sense that the tortoise of systematic scientific investment research has crept along until nowadays. Now people are saying, wow, look, these computers, they're really good, you know. And a lot of the most fashionable hedge funds actually nowadays in the current time are, are systematic driven and computer driven. And we've... Um, you know, born up to the pressure on the hedge fund industry mm. much better, we and our ilk, than, mm -hmm. than many of the discretionary traders. H but how much is it hype and how much is it actually real science? Well, you know, things go through hype cycles. This is, the, this is kind of the third AI boom or the fourth maybe since the 50s, you know, mm. um, what they call neural networks were invented in the late 1950s. That's when neural networks were invented. Mm -hmm. When you consider that a lot of the current uh, excitement is about deep neural networks, mm. that is 70 years after the, the idea of the neural network um, was invented by, you know, an American psychologist who I've forgotten the name of. I can remember the name of the network. It was called the Perceptron in the 1950s. Um, certainly all the neural networks failed completely in the 1990s. There were a lot of hedge funds set up yeah. using neural networks. So I was very, very skeptical uh, for my sins. I was very skeptical for a long time, but right. I've been kind of one round. There have been further developments in confusing and neural networks. and you know, this, this stuff does move forward. Computers have got a lot more powerful. We have lots of people working with aspects of, mm -hmm. of um, you know, neural networks and things mm -hmm. now. But I would say that our field was machine, it always has been machine learning of a sort. Well, David, wonderful to have you with us. If we can take your quantitative work, and I know Paul Wilmot worked for you years ago, and the work of Nassim Taleb and Kent Osborne and other quants, there's the idea of there always becomes a one-way bet. Is the short VIX trade now, bring up the chart, this is my chart of the year, and I understand there's a time decay on the chart, but nevertheless, the short VIX persistency now, now David, is that the new portfolio insurance of 1987? Are we getting ourselves into a very small box with the inertial force of quiet? I don't, we don't trade the VIX very much. I don't really like the VIX because it's a derived quantity. It's derived using the Black and Scholes equation. Uh, and the Black and Scholes equation is based upon the idea of market efficiency, which I fundamentally <coughs> don't agree with. So I, I don't agree with that branch of mathematics, which gives rise to the VIX. I think the VIX is not an entirely safe thing. So if you were to speculate that it might be involved in some future kind of financial problem. Perhaps in that respect it's a bit like Bitcoin. It's very poorly understood. A lot of people get yeah. quite excited about it and I wouldn't be that surprised to see it involved in some future accident. Okay, well let's go to Nassim Taleb then. If we're not in the, the Black Scholes space, if we're not in the Gaussian space, a predictable space, what are the fat tails you see right now? Oh, I don't tend to make forecasts about the future because our investment management method is really based upon a great kind of humility that we don't know what's going to happen in the future. We can only ever, with our methods, have a slight forecasting edge 
we never make forecasts of the, of the character. You know, the market's going to be up, you know, 10% by the end of next year. When you ask me, what do you think the market's going to do by the end of next year? I say, oh, I think it's going to be up. The S&P is going to be up, you know, plus five points, plus or minus 100. At that point, I always get a huge laugh from the audience. Yeah. It's funny that they're laughing about the truth. It's funny that they laugh about the truth, whereas if I said, oh, I think the market's going to be up 10%, yeah. plus or minus 1%, Clearly, I can't possibly know. Nobody knows to within that no. range of error what the, what the future is going to be. So there, you're in the entertainment industry. You're not actually in the serious forecasting industry. Poor Rupert. He, he has to make calls. He needs I know, to it's take a bet. I know. I wish I didn't have to make more calls. <laughs> Just get AI. <laughs> I mean, the interesting thing is that I think that even fundamental investors are increasingly using AI and big data as inputs into their process. I think that everyone's, you know, in, in many ways kind of running to catch up with these trends. But are AI funds difficult to sell to clients, David? And actually, are, are they even harder to explain to regulators if something goes wrong? You know, I don't, I'm not really aware of there being any funds that are actually called AI funds at the moment. I mean, you do read occasionally on Bloomberg about somebody who's bought yeah. a fund that they're calling an AI fund, but funds like ourselves and Renaissance Technologies and Two Sigma and DE Shaw have been around for 40, 30, 40 years. We never build ourselves as AI. People would have laughed at us at once upon a time. Um, I think anyone who builds themselves self-consciously as an AI fund is probably slightly jumping on, you know, it's a bit of, a bit of hype. hype involved. But the idea that, you know, is the future of investment management, does it involve using computers, you know, <clears throat> computers, data, technology, and to some extent the scientific method? Is that an important aspect of the future of investment management? I think, yeah, more, more, more credibly than ever yeah. it is. David, you mentioned earlier the idea of, uh, of, of, of not trying to predict out, not trying to extrapolate into the future. Tell us about what a lot of people are writing about this weekend with the path of volatility or agitation. What is the impact of a jump condition or the likelihood of a jump condition? Does it matter if on the VIX, which you don't like, but let's use it as a proxy, that we go 9, 11, 13, 15, 19, say, or are you worried about a jump condition where we abruptly move to more volatility? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm always worried about um, the thing that one is most worried about in markets is a crash, you know, discontinuity, which is, and if there's a big jump in the VIX, it won't be because the VIX has, it won't be because the S&P suddenly gone up 15% <laughs> because there's a crash. So everyone's always worried about a crash. The crash, it, you, you know, crashes are, or le leverage is always implicated in some way. It was really in the, um, in the 2008 crash, but of course, little known to us all, perhaps, uh, the leverage was hidden inside the very institutions at the heart of the banking system. So none of us really knew those guys were all 40 times leverage. No. None, of us, none of us actually knew that. Amazing. Even the Queen of England didn't know that. You know, you are going to ask, when the Queen of England went around, she said, she said, did nobody foresee this coming? So the Queen of England is smarter than, you know, most bankers. You know. <laughs> there you go, Tom. <laughs> there we go. Maybe he's just working for an invite to the wedding there, Francine, as well. Rupert Harrison with us at BlackRock and David Harding of the Wynn Group. Thrilled to have his brain power on your Physics Monday here on Bloomberg Surveillance. You need to be briefed in your car coast to coast. Of course, Canada as well. Robert Moon, Karen Moscow, Bloomberg Daybreak in New York, Washington, Boston. Also on Sirius XM, Channel uh, 119. A briefing in your car. Bloomberg Daybreak, Bloomberg Radio.
surveillance in New York, in London, our new studios in London. Francie McCraw breaking things in. Beautiful, right by Mansion House, for those of you that know uh, London and St. Stephen's of Walbrook Church as well. David Harding with us. Wonderful to have the giant of quantitative finance with us with Winton Group and Rupert Harrison of BlackRock with us, the giant of... Uh, uh, taking good photos of our new headquarters. Rupert, I love your photos of the headquarters out on Twitter uh, this morning. There's the volatility and there's physics envy, uh, Rupert. And then there's the reality. BlackRock has to deal with the quiet in the market. When you go into the meetings and you've got all that brain power, Jeff Rosenberg, Mr. Hildenbrand, and the others, what do you talk about about the quiet in the VIX, the quiet of market volatility? Yeah, we talk about this a lot, and actually I think that we would, um, I, I would personally kind of caution against the assumption that just because VIX is very low, it must be some source of instability. You know, if you go back over the long history of this data series, it's a, basically a kind of regime switching model. You get these low volatility regimes. Uh, in, in, in technical terms, David would, would agree, uh, I'm sure that the, these don't look path dependent. So the longer you've been in a low volatility regime doesn't affect the probability of switching to a high, high volatility regime. And then if you dig into what, is the, what are the triggers sometimes for that switch, it tends to be based around some kind of external macro volatility. And one of the other things we see in the world at the moment, which is very unusual, is very low volatility in macro data. Uh, that tends to be a sort of mid to late cycle phenomenon. We've got this very coordinated global recovery. Yeah. Uh, the volatility of those macro data, so the GDP and the inflation prints coming through is very low. And until that changes or until you get some kind of external stimulus, then you really can have these low volatility regimes continue for a long time. Are we going to look forward then to the regime change of quantitative tightening? I mean, I guess America is getting into it. I'm not sure that Julia Coronado with us in the next hour. But does QT become one of those outside conditions? Look, yeah, it could be. And certainly, you know, if you got a, an increase in rates volatility, that is at the kind of bottom of the stack in many ways. And you would see that propagated through other markets. In terms of again, you're thinking about the cycle, you normally get volatility starting to pick up when corporate margins start to get under pressure. You get into that late cycle period when credit spreads start rising, volatility starts picking up, even when equities can continue doing well. So I think the thing to look out for is evidence of late cycle activity in markets would be something that would be a, potentially a trigger for a higher volatility regime, but we don't see that yet. Um, David, I want to talk to you about CTAs, which is a strategy that actually Winton specializes in. They seem to be under a lot of pressure because of poor f performance, but also a lot of competition from some of uh, the, the cheaper risk premium funds. Can they still be relevant? Well, we started out very much as a CTA, and um, you, you know, we're still one of the biggest managers of CTA funds in the world. But yeah. um, the CTAs really uh, are synonymous with an investment style, which is called trend following. Yeah. That's what we've always done. Rather improbably, it's worked for the last 40 years. Now, as I say improbably because all conventional theories are that it can't possibly work. The market's supposed to be efficient, uh, as you know. So it's odd that it's worked. In the last 10 years, it hasn't worked as well as it had done previously. Well, that's because more, you know, eventually there are too many of them. the world wised up to it and there's more money being put, right. being put into it. So I don't forecast, you know, the future returns from C the CTA trend following strategy as being as high as they have been in the past. But I don't forecast them necessarily being zero either. You know, in other words, we continue to rely quite heavily on trend following. It's, uh, it's a strategy which has, um, you know, stood the test of time over a long period of time. Doesn't tend to correlate with other asset classes, you know, with, with long the stock market or long, long the bond market. And so, you know, on that basis, it has a positive spectrum of return and it's, and it's not correlated. The rational allocation to that sort of investment strategy is, is huge. Um, more than the strategy can take, actually. Right. But the demand for our products is destined to be exceed the possible supply for winter, and it's going to exceed the supply of it. But 2018 will be better for CTAs, or not necessarily? Well, we certainly don't make those kind of forecasts. <laughs> you know, I mean, most hedge fund managers are always trying to tell you what, how well they're going to do in the foreseeable future. So I feel like I'm letting you down. Um, but you know, <laughs> we forecast a long-term positive expected return from allocating to our strategy. We don't think it's that good from trend following only, which is why we've tried to broaden out and use lots of other what we call explanatory variables, what other people would call reasons. Right. Reasons yeah. For, yeah. to bet on, but reasons which have been scientifically researched and stood the test of time, not reasons that we pull out of a hat, mm -hmm. you know, on the basis of reading the news. We've got no advantage in understanding politics. We've right. got no advantage in understanding 
you know, current economics. Right. As for the long-term relationship between asset returns and things that might affect them, they yeah. might have an advantage. Um, David, you had to cut fees this year. Are you still seeing pressure on fees? Uh, well, I wouldn't say we had to cut fees. We chose to cut fees because we felt that we had been, we, in recent years, too great a proportion of the returns that we'd made growth had been taken by us compared to our clients. Mm -hmm. So. We, we chose to cut, cut fees. Our fees have been declining over the years. 30 years ago, it was 6.15 and $60 round turn commissions, you know, and today it's uh, 0.9 and 16 um, for our institutional clients. So, you know, our, our fees have come down over time uh, because the volume has gone up massively. You know, when I say we had 6.15 and $60, a huge fund manager 30 years ago was kind of $200 million. <laughs> And today, as you said, we have, you know, $28 billion or something like that. So that obviously there are economies of scale and we need to recognise. I, I think it's fair for us to recognise that. If we, made, we might, if we make loads and loads and loads of money, we might put our fees back up again, you know. Okay, interesting. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll be back with David Harding and Rupert Harrison. Rupert Harrison of BlackRock Multi-Asset Strategist and David Harding of Winton Group both stay with us. Now, in the meantime, if you're a Bloomberg customer and we uh, hope you are, you can send us questions uh, going on to TV Go and then using the IB function. We'll have plenty more coming up. We'll focus on China and emerging markets. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance, uh, Tom and Francine from London and New York. London, of course, opening, inaugurating our new headquarters. Now, we're taking a breather in the wake of Battering Thursday. Uh, Chinese shares, I think, are resuming their decline this morning with some previously high-flying consumer and technology companies amongst the hardest hit. With us, uh, David Harding, CEO of Winton Group and Rupert Harrison, Portfolio Manager at BlackRock Multi-Asset Strategies. Uh, thank you both for uh, sticking around. Rupert, let me kick off with you and, uh, and China, right? 
how do they deal with the debt? And actually, if you look at the PBOC governor, it's not going to be an easy task. No, absolutely. And, and you talk about so Governor Joe's outgoing comments, um, uh, you know, really show that these concerns around debt sustainability and leverage have become, uh, you know, embedded in the senior ranks of the regime. The president is himself now very focused on this. I think that people are underestimating the extent to which the Chinese authorities are really determined to get to grips with this issue. They understand it's an existential threat to China's development model, and I think the market is still underestimating the short-term impact that this tightening is going to have, particularly in the property sector. We're seeing, you know, all these, these movements over the last few days there are some idiosyncratic reasons to do with kind of north-south flows in China, but also, you know, underlying it is this steady tightening of financial conditions in, in yeah. China, which is a very deliberate act by the authorities. Um, David, do you have access of Chinese data? If you look at the, uh, you know, where financial markets go next, if you were to, to crunch the, the, the data in China, I guess, you know, the, the returns would be invaluable. Oh, well, we've had an office in Hong Kong for many years, and we opened an office in Shanghai a few years ago. We're, one of the, we're probably the, one of the biggest foreign hedge funds in China. Uh, we manage money in Chinese markets for Chinese citizens. So we ship, don't ship, we're not QDII or QDLP, we don't take money in or out, but we're a big, we are the biggest foreign hedge fund probably in China. And that's been a, you know, we started 10 years ago, we built up very, very slowly, and I'm particularly proud of our success there, actually, <laughs> because it's taken me yeah. a surprise. You know. David, you've been doing it a while, and I guess China can be something of experience where there's been lots of predictions, a hard landing and such. What do the young Turks of the hedge fund business get wrong right now? What is it that drives you nuts when you see all these guys going out of business? Is it a concentrated trade? Is it, is it putting too much money into one bet, whether it's China or something different? Well, the thing that, um, you know, is frustrating is when other people claim to be able to do what you know, we have demonstrated that we've done over 30 years and they claim to be able to do it with no reputation and then they claim that there was no skill involved in it. So they say, you know, that there are people who will sort of simulate our track record and go, there we are, we can simulate it, therefore we can do it, and by the way, we're cheaper. And, you know, that's kind of annoying because it's giving no credit to the fact that, you know, I've been running this sort of business for the last 30 years, basically saying there is no skill and expertise in what, you know, these guys do, and I think to myself, well, 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 yeah, I do think, they do. where were you in 2008? You weren't actually, you didn't actually make money in 2008. What you're actually doing is running a structured derivatives desk at, you know, XYZ Investment Bank, and then that went wrong, and you lost clients all their money, and now you're doing something else, and now you claim yeah. you could have done what we did back then. You know, that's, that's the kind of thing that's annoying, but one right. needs to be calm. It was Zen, Zen yeah. peace is important. Okay, well. David, right. thank you so much. David Hardy, uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, this morning with Winton Group and, of course, Rupert Harris. Thank you so much for stopping by from BlackRock uh, as well. In our next hour, we begin to look to the Fed. We begin to look to December 13th. Julia Coronado will join us from Macro Policy Perspective, particularly on the quiet conundrum of the holidays. Where's the inflation? I know where the leftover turkey is. This is Bloomberg.